as we continue our look at World War I, now we have to think about how important were some of the other fronts in the war. There are four parts to this, and this video is going to deal with the first part, which is who won the war at sea. So, who won the war at sea? I know you want to know. Boom. So, one of the things to remember is leading up to the war, you had that naval arms race between Great Britain and Germany. And this arms race increased the pre-war tensions. But despite this arms race being a cause of the war, there were very few major naval battles. And again, despite all of the money that was spent on building up these navies, the battles that did occur were not decisive in influencing the outcome of the war. However, Britain's control of the English Channel and the North Sea were important to her eventually winning the war. Now, what did Britain want to get out of all of this? So what kind of Navy happenings was Britain looking for? Now, at the beginning of the war, Britain and Germany had very different aims. Now, for Britain, what they were really interested in was maintaining the supply lines with their major trading partners. One, because they needed those supplies to feed the population and to um, feed the um, armament industry. And then what they really wanted was to maintain the supply lines with Northern France, because of course, that means that they would be able to supply France as well as their own soldiers with the things needed to fight the war. Now, in order to do this, what they were hoping to do is they were gonna choke, that's right. They were gonna use that Navy and choke the heck out of Germany, choke them into submission using a blockade along Germany's coastline. Now, Germany eh, had some different things going on. Their goals were slightly smaller and more limited than Britain. Now, when they developed their navy, they hadn't really thought that much about deploying it. This massive development of the navy was for deterrence. And for them, it would then play a limited role in fighting. And you'll see this in the war itself. So the main aim during the war was to be like, hey, 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 me got a big old Navy. You don't want to fight with me, but in German. And they would then also use small attacks to reduce the size of the British Royal Navy. And by doing this, they would then be in a good place. Having reduced the British Navy, when it came down to negotiating to end the war, then they would be in a much better place for negotiation. Now, you and I both know, spoiler alert, that is not what happened. But, now, they spent so much money building up this Navy. When it came down to um, the war, they started feeling pressure to actually use the Navy. I mean, to be fair, right? If you got it, why not use it? And so the Navy is going to be used in small, close attacks on British forces. They're going to lay minefields in the North Sea, and they're going to use the submarine force. Now, for both Britain and Germany, it was important. They needed the control of the North Sea in order to achieve those aims. Even though their aims differed, control of the North Sea was paramount for both. But Britain had way more ships than Germany did. Britain had a two to one advantage in battle cruisers and a 1.6 to one in all other ships. And Britain also controlled the bottlenecks of the North Sea and the English Channel. Basically, Germany's only option to get into the Atlantic was to go through the North Sea and the English Channel, and both of these areas were quite small in size. Therefore, mm -mm, mm -mm, things did not look so hot for Germany. Seriously, y'all. Now, as said earlier, there were very few major 
battles in World War I. However, in 1914 and 1915, we did have some notable ones, right? In August 1914, there was the Battle of Something, <laughs> and Germany pretty much got their butts kicked on this one. They lost um, 712 soldier, sailors, and Britain lost 35. Germany also lost six ships. Now, when we get to November 1914, dun, 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 this is not so good for Britain. This is the first time that they lost a, a naval battle since 1812. So a hundred years and uh, they lost that one. In uh, December of 1914, we have the Battle of the Falcon Islands and Britain wins this one with a lot of uh, fatalities for the Germans and no ships lost on the British side. And again, in December, um, the German high seas fleet attacked some towns along the British coast. And then in January, 1915, we had a British attack on the German high seas fleet and they inflict some casualties and sink a cruiser. Now, if you look at this handy dandy map here, you can see where the British laid mines, um, the German laid mines. We have some of these uh, bombardments uh, that the Germans did on British cities. Now, one of the things to kind of look at is you can see here towards the bottom um, near Dover, that is the choking point, that bottleneck point of the English Channel, which is only 34 kilometers um, wide at the narrowest point. And then if you look up to the north, you have again the same thing where you have um, British islands and that choke point, that bottleneck point to access the Atlantic. Now, got some questions to answer. Hit a pause, slow your roll, and consider, why was control of the sea vital to both Great Britain and Germany during the First World War? And number two, who do you think had achieved the most from the early naval encounters in 1914 and 1915? And of course, you must give a why. So let's have a chat about the Battle of Jutland. Now, before this battle, Germany operated on a hit and run basis. Again, remember, the Navy wasn't so much for fighting, but deterrence. And so what they would do is they would hit a British ship, sink it, and hightail it out of there before the Grand Fleet could get there to tackle them. Now, Scheer, to the right, was given naval command in 1916, and he wanted to hit the British hard. So, let's go, mano a mano. To the left, we have the British Jellico. To the right, we have the German Scheer. Let's get ready to rumble! Both the population of Britain and the Royal Navy wanted a decisive naval battle. This is because Britain was such a historic naval power and they had had great naval victories in the past. And of course, as we said before, the British Navy hadn't lost a battle since 1812. And on top of that, uh, they had this really amazing Navy and they wanted to use it. And by the time we're, t we're almost two years into the war and there has been no big major naval battle. And it was hoped that this Battle of Jutland would provide that naval victory. So both British and German naval commanders, their aims fit with the larger aims of their respective countries. Now, two men stand before me, rather, Two men stand on boats. One will sink, one will swim. Who shall it be? So Germany's commander Scheer, what he wanted to do was to lure the British fleet from its base. 
And then they would use merchant um, ships. They would attack the merchant ships in the North Sea, and these attacks would bring the British out. Now, the attacks on shipping would be a good trap because the main British aim was to keep the supply lines open. So this would pull the British into a trap, and this would allow the Germans to destroy the battle cruiser fleet. And then he would use the rest of his fleet to then destroy Jellicoe's forces. Now, what they were really look, hoping for is that this trap would reduce the size of the British Navy and bringing it closer to the size of German forces. And as we said before, these equality of forces would allow for negotiations. However, Jellico knew what was up. He was like, mm -mm, I know what you're thinking, you know, but in British. And he was aware of Shear's plans and instead sent the Grand Fleet. He sailed out of port earlier than what Shear expected. And then he decided to lay in wait to crush, crush Shear. Right? The idea was to damage the German high seas fleet as much as they possibly could. Now, Jellicoe had greater numbers than Shear's fleet. Jellicoe was faster, they had better guns, however, they had weaker armor. And this weaker armor was chosen as it would provide for greater speeds and maneuverability. And Jellicoe hoped that this would prove to be decisive. But within the first hour, Germany sank uh, two ships, two British ships, and this resulted in 2,868 deaths. But Jellicoe had a trap of his sleeves. Basically, Scheer would follow Admiral Beatty's ships, and then that would leave him crushed by Jellico. It would leave him able to be crushed by Jellico. And so basically what happened is there was heavy fog from the blasting of the guns, and there was poor communications between the ships within each fleet. The battle lasted for only a few minutes, but the British did huge damage to German ships. And Scheer was like, oh, oh no, this is not working out, but in German. And so he realized that he was sailing into a trap that now Jellicoe had set. And so he was like, uh, you know what? Peace out, I got to go. So he instead turned around and sailed for home and he made it back to port the following morning. And he, Sheer, used submarines to provide cover, which meant that Jellicoe could not effectively pursue Sheer. So the Battle of Jutland was the largest naval battle in history. 250 ships, 100,000 men, three days and both sides, that's right, both sides say that they won. So let's think about this. Who won the Battle of Jutland? Both sides claim that I, I am the master, I am the victor. Germany and Britain. So Germany lost 11 ships, including one battlecruiser, while Britain lost 14 ships, including three battlecruisers. Germany lost 3,000 men, dead or wounded, but Britain lost almost 7,000 men, dead, wounded, and captured. Afterward, Germany was able to deploy 10 large ships immediately, and Britain was able to deploy 24 large ships. Germany was like, um, this did not work out so hot. So they never risked another major sea battle again. Britain maintained her control of the North Sea and was able to maintain the blockage to the North German coast. So who do you think actually won and why? Still thinking about who won the war at sea. So. Let's take a look at the tactics that were used. So let's have a chat about blockades. 
Now, Jellicoe did not do so hot in terms of having a major milita military victory at Jutland, but his blockade would have a massive impact on the outcome of the war. Blockading commercial ships has been a British military tactic since the 1700s. Now, soon after the outbreak of the war, they declared the North Sea to be a British military area. And this allowed them to be able to intercept merchant ships and stop them from bringing in materials that could help the war effort in Germany. Now, keep in mind that neutral country ships would be trading with both sides. This is going to have a massive impact on Germany. They are not going to be able to adequately feed their population. The daily caloric intake went from 2,200 calories on average per person to 1,000. The imports fell by 60%, and this is going to slowly strangle the German economy. They didn't have the resources needed for the arms industry. And think about what impact that is going to have on their ability to fight the war. There were food riots uh, throughout Germany and Austro-Hungary, and people begin eating atypical foods. For example, you know, horse meat became kind of yummy. Um, 1917 was called the turnip winter because the shortage of potatoes meant that people ate turnips. And turnips are something that is usually exclusively given to um, animals for food. So let's look at another major tactic of war in the seas, and that is submarine warfare. Britain was also vulnerable to blockade. 60% of all food was imported. Germany declared the seas around Britain to be a war zone and therefore will sink any ship that is military or merchant ships that looked like it was headed to Great Britain or Ireland. Now, submarines were basically the only choice because as we've spoken about before, Britain had the numerical advantage and they had control of the North Sea and the English Channel. Now, Germany didn't have the ships to successfully bomb British ports. And therefore, what they could only do is use the submarines to try to even the game a little bit. And this unrestricted submarine warfare uh, didn't turn out so hot. Right? So they sank the Lusitania in May 1915. They sank a liner called the Arabic. Um, and these two things lead to huge international outrage. And the US basically tells Germany, dude, you best slow your roll and stop this uh, unrestricted submarine usage. And this was because a large number of American citizens died, and this brought about the possibility of American intervention in the war. And so Germany at this point was like, oh, I do not want that to happen. And so they stopped this type of warfare, but uh, only temporarily, you know what I'm saying? But Germany started to rethink about using this unrestricted submarine warfare again near the beginning of 1917. Basically, desperation was starting to set in as they hadn't achieved a victory on the Western Front and uh, things weren't going so well. And of course, they're fighting this two front war. So uh, the other thing is because Germany had a smaller navy, they hadn't been able to reduce the size of the British fleet. And so they couldn't really take the British fleet on, on the surface of the water. So submarine it was. Um, the other thing that they're trying to do is maybe try to wrap things up before the Americans became too involved. There's the possibility of American intervention, if they could force Britain to negotiate or force an ending of the war before the Americans get come in, then um, this could help. And essentially, it's just this point of desperation. Keep in mind that the British blockade has been going on, and the British blockade is having a great impact on the German economy. Now they start this uh, submarine warfare and it has a devastating impact on 
Britain. They lost so much shipping that by the end, uh, they start, they have to start rationing the food. By the summer, Britain had lost 1,500 merchant sailing sailors and more than 2.8 million tons of shipping. And so this was, uh, a really impactful on Britain. But Britain changes her tactics some, and there are a number of strategies that they start using to counter German U-boats. And the other thing is it had the opposite effect, and this pulled the US into the war. And as we'll see later on, this of course is going to have a large impact on the war's outcomes. So if you look at this handy dandy chart here, we have submarine numbers from Germany and Britain in, in 1914 and 1918. And you can see here that in those years, Germany developed and um, put out into the field, or waters in this case, significantly more submarines than Britain did. And you can see at the beginning of 1914, Britain had more submarines, but Germany shifted towards heavy use of the submarine. And as you can also see that they lost quite a bit as well. So let's look at some of the strategies that Britain used to counter the U-boats. First, they use Q-ships. These are heavily armed ships that lured submarines to the surface. Um, basically, these are ships that were disguised as merchant ships. And when the, um, submarines would see them and come up to the surface. They had guns hidden under fake lifeboats, and then they would then attack the submarines. They have a somewhat mixed record though. Um, the Q ship sank six German U-boats, um, while the German U-boat sank 23 Q ships. Ding, 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 winner, the German U-boats. Uh, mines were laid in the North Sea between Norway and Britain. And this was super dangerous for submarines because, uh, you know, they get blown up and stuff. So, advantage, Britain. And beginning in the summer of 1916, one of the things that they did was they um, sent the merchant ships in convoy systems. So the merchant ships were escorted by battleships and sometimes aircraft. And... It was dangerous for U-boats to attack in daylight and uh, because the planes would be up ahead and it would be able to see them and possibly drop depth bombs. And they wouldn't be able to pick up isolated ships since everybody's in a convoy. So this was pretty successful. It greatly reduced the number of ships lost. Uh, between May 1917 and the end of the war, only 168 out of more than 16,000 merchant ships were lost. So the convoy system was quite successful. And so by the end of 1917, the worst of the danger from the U-boats was over. As you can see here, this is essentially how the convoy system worked. There are all of the merchant ships in the middle, and along the outside, following zigzag pattern, you would have your battleships, and then you would have a plane overhead. And here's a picture of what this looked like in uh, real life. And thus ends the tale of blockades and submarine warfare.